Jumana K. Roos. You've seen her images on giant billboards across the metro. Jumana K. Roos. You've seen her images on buses across the city. Now get to know Jumana K. Roos. The war broke out in my home country, Lebanon. I was 11 years old and I saw a lot of bloodshed and inequality and poverty. You can't grow up in an environment like that and not be affected by it and not want to make a difference. I graduated from Yale University with a master's in ethics. I speak four languages. It has always been innate in me fighting for the underdog and trying to do whatever it is I can to make a difference in the world. Let Jumana Kairos protect your rights. Call the law offices of Jumana Kairos at 1-866-YOUR rights extension 100 or visit yourrights.com مكاتب المحاميه جمانه كيروس تتمنى لكم السلامه في ظل انتشار وباء كوفيد 19 المحاميه جمانه كيروس مثلت على مدى 22 عاما ضحايا حوادث السيارات مع طاقم من المحامين ذوي الخبره وحصلت لموكليها على تعويضات بمئات الملايين من الدولارات قبل ان تختار المحامي الذي سيدافع عن قضيته دقق في تاريخه المهني ومع مكاتب جمانه كيروس تنذهل باراء مئات الموكلين وخبراتهم الايجابيه في جو مكاتب المحامية جمانة كيروز يتحدثون لغتك العربية والكلدانية 248-557-3645 والاستشارة مجانية مكتب المحامية جمانة كيروز يعلن عن استقبال الموكلين والمراجعين في العنوان الجديد 24370 North Western Highway Southfield على مسافة قريبة من موقع المكتب القديم مكتب المحامية جمانة كيروس يتعامل مع كافة قضاياكم المتعلقة بالإصابات الشخصية من ضمنها حوادث السيارات، إصابات العمل، الأخطاء الطبية بالإضافة إلى قضاء الهجرة والتجنس، الإفلاس، الضمان الاجتماعي وقوانين العائلة والاستشارات مجانية 248-557-3645 برنامج يور رايتس مع المحامية جمانة كيروس المختصة في قضايا حوادث السيارات مع نخبة من المحامين في اختصاصات عدة منها الطلاق والهجرة والإفلاس يأتيكم الآن على الهواء مباشرة أسعد الله قاتكم بالخير مستمعينا في كل مكان أهلا بكم في هذه الحلقة الجديدة من برنامج يور رايتس مع المحامية جمانة كيروس تأتيكم على الهواء مباشرة وكالمعتاد نستقبل اتصالاتكم على الأرقام 313-769-6666 5192561023 دائما على الواتساب ورقم الواتساب هو 3133277074 بامكانكم ايضا الحصول على استشارات مجانيه من مكاتب المحاميه جمانة كيروس في الاختصاصات التي تعامل معها وهي قضاء الاصابات الشخصيه من ضمنها حوادث السيارات، اصابات العمل، الاخطاء الطبيه، قضاء الهجره والتجنس، قضاء الافلاس، قضاء الضمان الاجتماعي وقوانين العائله، رقم الهاتف هو 3645 حلقات برنامج يور رايتس دائما نحملها على اليوتيوب كل ما عليكم هو زياره قناه جمانه كيروس على اليوتيوب والاستماع مره اخرى الى الحلقات السابقه من هذا البرنامج والاستفاده من المعلومات المقدمه فيها اهلا بكم مره اخرى جمانه مساء الخير مساء الخير رامي يعطيك الف عافيه كيفك اليوم الله يعافيك الحمد لله نسال عنك ان شاء الله بخير كثر خير الله مساء الخير لكل المستمعين ومساء الخير لضيفتنا لليوم مثل كل نهار ثلاثة المحامية ماريا بنشينكو اللي اختصاصها بكريمينال لو فاميلي لو مثلا رامي دومستيك فايلنس هي تعتبر كريمينال لو على فكرة بعض المخالفات السيرية حكينا آخر أسبوعين وهذا الموضوع نال فيري جود فيدباك من قبل كثير أشخاص عن موضوع الـ CDL أو الـ Commercial Drivers Licenses ومثل ما حضرتك قلت هيدول الحلقات وكل حلقات موجودين على The Jumana Kiroos YouTube Channel سو so منستقبلها لليوم ومنرحب فيها المحامية ماريا بانشينكو Good afternoon ماريا Happy to have you Good afternoon Jumana Good afternoon Rami Good afternoon Good afternoon ماريا uh, We are March 23 Today is March 23 Yes I be- Right. So we are very, very close to the new expungement laws changing, if I am not mistaken. And I don't have, we, we've talked about expungement a couple of times before. We'll talk about it again and again uh, if, if our listeners request it or they call us with questions. But we know that the laws, the new expungement laws, will become effective on April 12th. So that's in about two, two and a half weeks. What can you tell us about the 
what is changing? Uh, have you received forms? Do you know anything? We're not talking about how the law is changing today. I think as we get closer to April 12th, we should do a refresher session on that. But For sure. we're happy to take questions if anybody wants to, no problem. But we're not necessarily talking about that. But as we are nearing these uh, changes in expungement laws, is there anything new? Well, um, there's definitely a lot of interest. Everyone is curious of how this process is going to go, um, mainly in the effects for the lawyers. We're all watching to see if the forms are going to change. So we've always used the same forms to apply for uh, expungements and people who are doing them on their own have always used the same forms. And so we've all been watching the state court administrator's office um, and the forms that uh, have always been used to see if they're going to amend those forms and change them before the law takes effect to comport or to um, comply with what the new expansions are uh, because of the fact that you're able to expunge multiple uh, uh, different felonies and misdemeanors at a time. Yeah. Yes. We're wondering, yeah, we're very curious to find out if that form will change. So I definitely encourage uh, those who are waiting for this law to change to keep watching the forms, because if you go to apply after April 12th and they change the form, it might be rejected. And I know we've talked about this on previous shows, Jumana, you only get one bite at the apple. So make sure right. that you're doing it the right way or call Call us and, you know, let's have that consultation and make sure that everything is ducks in a row, I's dotted, T's crossed. Yes, you did say that before, that you can do it yourself, so to speak, but you get only one chance at submitting a motion. So if for some procedural reasons you submit it wrong or you don't attach all the documents, unfortunately, you lost that one chance. You only have one chance, which in my opinion means that one better better hire a lawyer because you only get one chance. You cannot try again and fix it the second time around. Am I right? That's right. Um, there are very few circumstances, um, depending on the judge, but if, if you're not allowed to withdraw the application and you've done it wrong and they, uh, the, the judge hears your case, and makes a ruling, um, there's going to be uh, an issue with your ability to apply again uh, because it is it is a one one time shot. So, and and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Hire a lawyer, call us, and let's talk about it because you're this is more than you know the fee that you have to pay the lawyer. If you do it right and it gets done right, you are going to excel in your business. You're going to excel in your ability to um, earn a better living, and it will make up for whatever it is that the lawyer is going to cost if it's done right and you get that off your record the correct way. In other words, there is too much at stake, and you only have one chance at doing it right. So, um, yes, I agree. You should hire a lawyer. This question of hiring a lawyer is always in the background, and there are no laws. There aren't any laws that I am aware of that say for this you must hire a lawyer. Hiring a lawyer is entirely a personal decision. The question becomes, when is it in my interest to hire a lawyer? That's all it is. There is no law that says you need to hire a lawyer. The question for you is, are you capable? Do you have the time? Do you have the know-how? Are you competent to do this successfully? And two, if you, if you mess it up, do you get a second chance? You just said in the expungement laws, you don't get a second chance. In, in immigration law, you don't get a second chance. Or you can make it very, 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 very hard, you know, to, to have a second chance. And you may have to wait a very, very long time. We hear Sam talk about that all the time. So yeah. there is... And it could cost you more too, right, Jumana? If somebody has to go back and try to fix something, you've created a situation where there's more work, more lawyer's fees. So rather than create that that dilemma um it's best to just you know at least call a lawyer and have a conversation about uh what's going on so that you can understand fully what you are risking by not um, making sure that you're doing it right the first time 
And you know what I say to people? If you're not sure you want to hire a lawyer, call more than one lawyer. Where is the problem? If they all tell you the same thing, whatever that is, then you know they're not all lying. They're not all misrepresenting. Lawyers shouldn't be lying or misrepresenting, but they're not saying it out of self-interest. They're telling the same thing. And then you will know more whether you really need to hire a lawyer or not. Saving money is a great thing. We have to be careful where we save money. If it costs more problems, more headaches, more costs down the road, better leave it in the hands of a professional than do it ourselves. And that's the case in everything in life, not just needing a lawyer. Um, You know, tearing your plumbing at home, and if you don't know what you're doing or you think you know a little bit about it, and you create a huge disaster, and now you have to bring in a plumber. So, you know, this, this kind of philosophy, this isn't just about hiring or not hiring a lawyer. It's about everything in life. Do I have the time? Do I have the patience? Do I have the knowledge? Do I have the expertise? Does it require a lot of knowledge? Does it require a lot of brain work? Does it require a lot of you know, uh, expert knowledge. Do I have the time? Do I have the patience? Can I follow through? Can I follow up? These are very personal questions that every person has to answer for himself or herself. Um, Speaking of do it yourself, you were telling me about a scenario of someone who called uh, two parties, you know, and they mean well, they mean well. This is about educating one another, nothing more. These these two parties were going through a divorce. They are in agreement on everything, including the uh, 401k and how to divide it up. And so they decided they don't need lawyers and they drafted what's called a judgment of divorce so that the, the, the judge signs it off and boom, they are divorced. And it ended up being disastrous. They ended up hiring you. Uh, you ended up charging because it was not straightforward about $1,500, and it was messy, it was lengthy, lengthier, Um, it was irritating and annoying and emotionally stressful for both parties. They meant well when they didn't hire a lawyer because they saw that they are in agreement on everything. Tell us a little bit about that scenario. What happened exactly? So exactly what you said. They they agreed on everything. They did not see the need to have an attorney and incur the additional expense. And they felt that they were able to draft the, the documentation. And, and, and this is not to say that it can't be done. It can be done. But when you have some complicated property uh, divisions, such as a 401k or a pension or something that is a little bit more complex than just we are splitting up the dishes, you know, it, it, it requires specific statutory language that needs to be written very, very um, precisely so that it actually can function the way you want it to function once it's been entered by the court. And what I mean by that, Jemana, is, is that sometimes in our judgments of divorce, we have things that need to happen after the divorce, and it's written exactly what to do great example is this case. This case, they wrote a judgment of divorce themselves and it split up a a 401k and it was supposed to be split down the middle, 50-50. That's what they wanted. That's what they wrote. But the way that they wrote it in their judgment together, they did it together. um, It did not meet the criteria that was necessary for the 401k, uh, the person who splits it up it's, it's called a plan administrator. The person who splits it up was unable to use that judgment of divorce to create the split of the 401k because it did not have the required language under the statute, under Michigan law, in order to, to do it. So they were stuck and couldn't get done what they wanted, which was to split up the 401k 50-50%. This, of course, like you said, exactly the way you said it, that it created stress, it created emotional turmoil, they started to begin to disagree, and now they're um, upset, and they're fighting, and, um, you know, one of them threw up their hands and said, I'm not doing anything about it, too bad for you, you don't get this money. Well, that's not exactly how things work, but in order to make them work efficiently exactly again as you said now you have to hire a lawyer 
we have to go in and fix the language and it costs um, more than it would have cost if you would have just had the lawyer draft the, the, the document in the first place the right way. And it's exactly um, the result that we're discussing today because um, when it finally got corrected in the court system, now you have two parties that were otherwise getting along just great, upset with one another, disagreeing with one another, costing um, money, fighting and it, it turned into a big mess all because it wasn't drafted the way that an expert that knows the law and that knows the requirements that have to be put in there for it to function after it's entered and um, there's a lot of things that go into a judgment of divorce that create scenarios after the divorce is over like splitting a 401k or selling a house that you own together things of that nature um, if they're not drafted correctly, they're, they can't be accomplished later on when you go and say, okay, it's time to split up the things we said we were going to split up. The divorce is over. Let's do this. Well, you can't now because the way you've written the judgment of divorce makes it impossible for whatever third parties that have to be involved to get done um, those, those things, those property divisions. Um, to do it. So it's, it's so imperative, at least at the very least, hire an attorney to review what you've written. You know, to, I was, you just, you just took the words out of my mouth. So they're in agreement, but your advice will have been, would have been hire a lawyer to review the language to make sure it complies with the Michigan compiled laws and the case law, because that's what's required for the administrator of the 401k to divvy up the plan. So they would have hired someone like you for an hour or two, and that would have cost a lot less than $1,500, and it would have been way faster than trying to fix it after the fact. Absolutely. And, and a lot of attorneys are very happy to, um, you know, charge a, a reduced fee for something that's just a review. You're not hiring the attorney to get involved in your case in any other way. You're, you're just asking them to say, here's this document. It's a legal document. I'd like you to review it. This is something that we do all the time for even if you're buying a house or some, we're just looking at things, making sure they're in your best interest. We're looking at things to make sure that they're, like you said, comporting with the laws and are compliant with what's required under statute. Um, and also to, to make sure that it, it's going to be functional and it's going to work and it's not written in, in a convoluted way and not by any, you know, like you said, no ill will between the parties. They weren't trying to create a problem, but it just sometimes things have to be written in a legal manner so that it operates and it is functional. And that is what, you know, an attorney can at least give you some insight and say, this is what I've noticed that could go wrong. You might consider changing this because, you know, of whatever reason, or this is absolutely not going to work. You need to make sure this language is in here or it will not, it will not um, have the desired effect that you want. And I, I, go ahead. Thank you. When you're talking about things like a home. What kind of language are you looking for or is the court looking for? Is it also statutory from some Michigan compiled law or no? Well, a lot of times in in case, in divorce cases, there, there's different things that can happen with a marital home. Sometimes people, they, they agree that one person, will, one of the spouses will be awarded the marital home as their sole and separate property. They are going to own it by themselves. But there's a lot of different mechanisms. If there's a mortgage on the home still that's in both parties' names, um, how are we going to get around that issue? Um, what language needs to be put in there to make sure that the person who is giving up their right to the home is not going to have any liability um, to the home any longer if their name is on the mortgage? What language needs to be put in there for, um, you know, how long does the other person have to vacate the home? That that issue comes up all the time. You know, if it's not written in there, some people will stay and stay forever. And it's, you know, we have to go back to court and get them removed from the property. Um, and there's a multitude of different things that could go wrong if the language in the judgment regarding 
the property uh, division of the home. If, for instance, if the home is to be sold, Jumana, sometimes they, they don't know, no party gets the house, they're gonna sell the house and they're gonna split the proceeds. If there's um, liens on the property or if there's a mortgage on the property, um, if there's going to be a realtor involved in the sale of the home, who is the agreed upon realtor? These yes. are all things that come up that when we're looking at a judgment, we foresee potential issues that could arise if the if the judgment is silent to them. If you don't list what realtor you're going to use or you don't list an agreed upon sale price or the appraiser that you're going to use later after the judgment's already entered and you disagree and you say, I don't want to use that realtor. I want to use this realtor. And the judgment doesn't say what you have to do. Now you're at a standstill. And now the property is on uh, is not on the market as it's required to be according to the judgment and one party's upset because they're missing out on the, the proceeds of the home. They're trying to find a new home and things become delayed and we have to go back to court to get things resolved. So things um, involving a home are very important, making sure that the, um, uh, the property description is correct. So you're putting the right property in, in you're not you know selling your neighbor's house by accident. Um, something like that, um, you know, is not all too common, but uh, like that. It, it could be something that could become more of a problem later if it's not done correctly the first time and cost you more money. Yes, of course. And time and time and aggravation. Um, let's take a quick break, Maria. And I want to remind the listeners that we're talking to attorney Maria Panchenko every Tuesday. We go over family law, criminal law, landlord, tenant, uh, you know, uh, traffic matters, drunk driving. Uh, last two weeks, we talked about CDLs. Uh, any questions? 313-769-6666. And um, if you want to just send a radio WhatsApp message, that number is 313-327-7074. Uh, with bankruptcy and with family and criminal law, we don't get a lot of questions on the air. People don't want to be recognized or their voices, but we sure do get a lot of questions here uh, in the in the office. And sometimes, Maria, you know, you have your schedule and you have your court appearances and a number of our clients, but not all, require a translator. So sometimes you're not able to talk to those people immediately because we have to find the time in your schedule as well as one of the translators from our office to arrange for that meeting to happen or for that consultation to happen. Let's take a quick break and we will be back. مكتب المحامية جمانة كيروز يعلن عن استقبال المواكلين والمراجعين في العنوان الجديد 24370 North Western Highway Southfield على مسافة قريبة من موقع المكتب القديم مكتب المحامية جمانة كيروز يتعامل مع كافة قضاياكم المتعلقة بالإصابات الشخصية من ضمنها حوادث السيارات إصابات العمل الأخطاء الطبية بالإضافة إلى قضاء الهجرة والتجنس الإفلاس الضمان الاجتماعي وقوانين العائلة والاستشارات مجانية 248-557-3645 مكاتب المحامية جمانة كيروس تتمنى لكم السلامة في ظل انتشار وباء كوفيد-19 المحامية جمانة كيروس مثلت على مدى 22 عاما ضحايا حوادث السيارات مع طاقم من المحامين ذوي الخبرة وحصلت لمواكليها على تعويضات بمئات الملايين من الدولارات قبل أن تختار المحامي الذي سيدافع عن قضيته دقق في تاريخه المهني ومع مكاتب جمانة كيروس تنذهل بآراء مئات الموكلين وخبراتهم الإيجابية في جوجل ريفيوز مكاتب المحامية جمانة كيروس يتحدثون لغتك العربية والكلدانية 248-557-3645 والاستشارة مجانية Your Rights مع المحامية جمانة كيروس عودة لبرنامج Your Rights مع المحامية جمانة كيروس أرقام الهواتف في الاستوديو 313-769-6666 5192561023 جمعنا نرجع لك مرة أخرى شكرا وإلى بالمكتب عن بالأخص بسبب اللوك داون صار في انفصال وطرف من الطرفين ترك على ولاية أخرى والسؤال اللي بنسأل هل الشخص اللي موجود هون بيقدر يقدم طلب طلاق علما أنه الوايف أو الهزبند راحوا على ولاية تاني 
شخص مثلا بالتحديد ما زال عايش بميشيغان انفصل عن زوجته وعن ولاده اللي انتقلوا لنقول على ولاية كاليفورنيا هي مش ولاية كاليفورنيا حب يعرف إذا بيقدر يقدم الطلاق هو هون بميشيغان أتوني ماريا بانشينكو let's change the facts a little bit a gentleman we get these calls on a regular basis a number of families have been separated as a result of the lockdown uh, or the lockdown has um, you know expedited the problems in the relationship and uh, one of the uh, spouses relocated out of Michigan the question is for the remaining spouse here in Michigan man or woman can that person file for divorce here in Michigan given that the husband or the wife and possibly the children are in another state for example we had a gentleman call us who wanted to file divorce here in Michigan, although his wife and kids, let's say, they reside in California. Could he? Yes, he absolutely can. Yeah, uh, it's a a possibility. When you have children involved, it can be a little bit complicated, um, but your requirement is only so much so that you live in the state of Michigan for 180 days or six months, and that the county that you filed the divorce action in you've lived in that county for 10 days. If you can meet those jurisdictional requirements that are, are, are mandated, then you are able to file for divorce in, in that county. Now, if you have children that are residing out of state with your other spouse, um, if they've been gone for a very long time um, you know, uh, and have established a, a residency in another state, it can complicate matters and keeping the divorce case here in Michigan Um, so it's definitely going to be encouraged by me to make sure that you're making that movement in, in the court straight away. You want to get the kids back to Michigan or get the kids back to your jurisdiction. Um, you need to file pretty promptly. Um, you're not going to want to wait months and months and allow them to establish a school and all of the things there, because there is a possibility, a slight possibility that the uh, spouse that's living in California could say, well, this case really should be here because the kids have residency here. They've been here for years. Um, We want the case moved. There's a potential that that could happen. Um, Less likely if it's filed straight away. And if you don't have children, um, then then it will stay in Michigan. You filed first and you have a right to file here in Michigan. You live here and you have a right to the, the divorce jurisdiction being here. Absolutely. Not too long ago, we, um, a friend of mine, prominent person, uh, very successful, mm-hmm. reached out and stated that his wife, I believe, has filed for legal separation in California. And has he has children, three or four children, some of whom are minors. Uh, what was the issue with that case? There was a lot of back and forth between you and him. He's between mm-hmm. here and California. He has a business here. He has the same business in California. He's here some of the weeks. He's there some of the weeks. His wife, I believe, filed for legal separation in California. What was the issue with that case? It, it's similar to what we kind of just said is that, you know, first to file, you're the first person to file it. So the jurisdiction begins where you file the case. And because, um, the spouse, the wife was in the state of California and was filing first. Um, That's where the court case opened and and it remains. And there is an opportunity, of course, like I said, to um, try to get the case removed back here to Michigan to bring the kids back home to Michigan. And again, this is uh, the similar warning, make sure it's done very promptly after they leave the state because Um, you know, when the kids are already set up in this case, um, set up at school, they have, uh, established residency, they've made friends, um, things of this nature, they're building a life in that space. Um, it's difficult to come back, you know, months and months later and say, Michigan, please come take jurisdiction of this case because the kids should belong here in Michigan where they're from when they've been there for uh, sev- you know multiple years at a time that that that's where at, that, at that problem in that particular case it wasn't his idea to be separated from his wife no. it was her idea how yes. long had the, how long had his wife and children been in california can you tell me it was it was nearing two years okay so if he if he needed to do something to protect himself 
as soon as she left with the kids to California, he should have filed uh, some kind of divorce or legal separation proceedings and asked to bring the children back so that a Michigan court can have jurisdiction, correct? Yes. Um, but if, like if you said, it's what his idea. He didn't want that. Right. Exactly. And as you said, there's there's a, a little bit of a mitigating factor is that, you know, the the, the gentleman was um, still going there and visiting and, you know, they were still operating as husband and wife for, for those two years. You know, it's just that they that he w- had a business here and there. So he was the one that was going back and forth between the two states. And, th- and that's OK. But because she did file in California and she had been there for, for such a, a lengthy period of time, um, you know, that that complicated the the ability to bring it to Michigan um, because of the way that they operated for so, so many years. Well, not so many years, but, you know, almost two years. Now, I have heard from three men that uh, whose wives moved from Michigan to California and filed for divorce in California, that California is very friendly to women. Um, I know you practice only in the state of Michigan, but can you say something about California? I I have heard the same exact thing that you've heard um, on multiple occasions as well, that the the divorce courts throughout the state are very... um, in, in the case of where there's children and um, when there's a case of uh, a spouse, a female, the, the woman's spouse is, is a stay at home mother. They are very uh, mother friendly, very female friendly um, in the in the property division and in the spousal support division, um, as well as the custody um the custody uh, decisions that they make. I have heard the same thing. I don't know the laws. I don't know um, exactly what makes them, if it's a, if it's just kind of a trend that's going on in the courts, or if there's something that's written in or codified to statute that actually um, awards more um, in certain circumstances involving minor children or certain circumstances involving spouses that um, did not work during the marriage. Um, I'm not sure exactly where the um, rumor that California is female friendly comes from, um, but I do know that I have heard the exact same thing on multiple occasions. And I do believe that they have a um, shorter um, filing uh, requirement than Michigan. I think we have six months. I've heard that you can move to California and almost immediately file for, for the action of, of divorce or separation or custody. Um, I'm not, I don't, I can't speak to what the rule is, but I have heard the same rumor that it's a, it's a friendly place to move and hurry up and file for divorce and, um, or separation because of their jurisdiction requirements aren't as lengthy as ours. They don't have the same time requirements. So, um, Moving to California, you don't have to wait. You don't have to establish residency in California for six months in order for you to file in California against your Michigan spouse. I, I don't believe so. I don't. I don't believe they have the same uh, requirements. I have heard on more than one occasion that that you can simply move there and file. I don't think that they have a very long waiting period, if any. I'm not. Um, Again, I don't know the exact requirement, but I've heard that same rumor as along with the uh, female friendly rumor um, that California has these um, these shorter time frames to file. So people who are moving there are able to file right away rather than if somebody was living in California and left their spouse to come to Michigan, they would have to wait the full six months before they would be able to file the action in, in, Mm -hmm. in Michigan courts. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about spousal support. I think we had, we dealt with a situation or two in the past week or two. There was a question uh, from one of our clients about spousal support. Do you remember yes. what the scenario was? Yes, and it, spousal support is one of the major deterring factors for people to, if they feel that they're going to have to pay spousal support, um, that is one of the major deterrents for people to file for divorce. Um, well, let me clarify. What you mean by that is that a lot of people who feel that they may need to, f- that they may they may be obligated to pay spousal support if they get divorced, choose not to get divorced so that they don't have to pay 
spousal support, the old term for it was alimony. Correct. And, and it is a big factor for a lot of people. Um, they're very concerned about their financial circumstances and the fact that they may have to, to pay alimony or spousal support if they go forward with filing for divorce. And when they consult uh, with an attorney, a lot of times when they are made aware that, that they do fall into a spousal support case. Um, and what I mean by that is, is that after looking at all of the facts of your case, I or attorney, a family law attorney has said, okay, based on everything you've told me, you're probably going to have a spousal support obligation is what I'm seeing here. Um, a lot of times people are very um, nervous about that. They, it makes them very anxious in their financial circumstances and will um, be deterred from filing for divorce and will stay in in a marriage that perhaps they're not wanting to be in um, solely on the basis that they are um, not wanting to expose themselves to the possibility of having to pay spousal support. Um, and, and on the on the other side of that, when someone has had a action filed against them, uh, their spouse has filed for divorce. Um, when they find out that they they have to um, pay spousal support, or that their case is going in that direction, that we're going to have to argue or make a case for spousal support um, or against spousal support, they become uh, extremely nervous uh, about that. But spousal support, Jamana, is very complex. There's no specific. Um, no Can I interrupt for a minute? Yes. I just wanted to say, just to frame the discussion, that generally speaking, generally, we're going to look into the factors, but generally speaking, the longer a marriage has been going, the more likely um, w one of the persons in the couple is going to get spousal support, assuming the money is there. However, you did say to me, and, and it's been traditionally looked at a long-term marriage is, some, is, is a marriage uh, that's 10 years or more in duration. But you did say to me that recently in the past few years, you've seen cases where the court has said that one of the parties to the divorce is entitled to spousal support, despite the fact that the marriage was a shorter term marriage, like four years, let's say, depending on certain circumstances. Yes, and that's it, absolutely the key phrase there. Your your circumstances are going to make the difference in whether or not you fall into a category that does make your case an eligible case for looking into whether or not a spousal support uh, uh, obligation should be put into your judgment of divorce. And even if you've only been married for four years, um, there have been cases where it happens. It, it's not, it's rare. It doesn't happen every day, but it's definitely something that can happen based on your specific circumstances. And exactly as, as you said, you know, long-term marriages, we're, that's one of the first things that your family law attorney, the first thing that I'm going to look at, is this case a case for spousal support? Do we need to look at spousal support? As soon as I see that the marriage has been longer than 10 years, I start reviewing those those facts and, and reviewing the factors that you know might make a spousal support argument or against a spousal support argument um, depending on whom I represent now as I said spousal support is very complicated it's very complex there's no specific uh, formula to to decide whether or not or how much or how long you're gonna pay or who's gonna pay and as you said, Jumana, um, is the money even there? How much do these people really earn as as an annual income, or how how are they um, supporting themselves, and how did they conduct themselves during the marriage? is is a really big factor in figuring out whether or not, even though your marriage has been ten years or longer, twenty five years, um, what if anything is available for spousal support, if you're only making, uh, you know, if you're already inside of the lowest tax bracket or you're below poverty levels, these types of things might not even affect you despite your 
long-term marriage because of the, um, the low income. Um, but that's not always the case either. It, it's really fact specific. There are so many, uh, arguments that can go in and out, uh, including even, and I know we've talked about this before, is there domestic violence? That's something that's going to, um, impact a spousal support award. So it's very complex and, and making sure you understand what your, your, um, spousal support arguments are for or against is, is imperative to speak with your attorney about. Uh, Maria, how does uh, the charge or the conviction of domestic violence affect spousal support? Are you saying that if a person is otherwise entitled to spousal support, if this person has committed domestic violence, then she will be excluded or will be he will be excluded from child's spousal support? It's possible, but it's also possible that maybe not excluded, but perhaps a less a less or a more, uh, less or more might be awarded to you in a spousal support, considering um, it's part of your argument as an attorney and a part of your attorney or part of your attorney's argument, excuse me, to make that, you know, you've endured uh, spousal abuse or domestic abuse um, during the marriage and whether or not uh, that caused the breakdown. Um, it's not necessarily on its own. Um, going to make or break your argument, but it's definitely a factor that the court is going to look at. They're so, going so to look saying, at that. You're saying that, let's say, a woman who has been subjected to domestic abuse may get more in spousal support than she, she would have otherwise gotten if she was not the victim of domestic abuse. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's possible. Or uh, um, even a little bit more commonly, if you're uh, a woman who's been subjected to abuse and you would otherwise not really receive or you didn't have a very strong argument for alimony or spousal support um, that might strengthen your argument where a judge might not otherwise be inclined um, to grant um, a, a, an award of spousal support. Um, it is possible that they will now because of that argument and the fault that has been uh, attributed. Now, remember, Jimena, and we've talked about this before, and I know you know this, um, Michigan is a no-fault divorce state, but fault can play a factor in your argument for uh, spousal support. Um, you don't need to prove fault to get a divorce or obtain a divorce, and um, you don't Nobody needs to be at fault at all to have the divorce proceedings go forward. However, when you're talking about spousal support, fault does sometimes come into play and it does sometimes uh, get utilized as an argument. Infidelity, domestic abuse, things of this nature are definitely things that attorneys will argue when arguing for or against spousal support. So uh, cheating, uh, adultery, that would also, uh, let's say against the husband, uh, that will also play as a factor in the wife obtaining spousal support or more spousal support, not just domestic abuse. It, absolutely, and and that is kind of you know, and we don't we don't we don't want to stereotype. There's definitely men who have been victims of abuse. There's definitely women who have um, been victims of, uh, of infidelity. Of but in the more general terms. Uh, if a man is found his wife to be um, unfaithful and he would otherwise have to pay spousal support, his attorney is likely going to argue that the cause of the breakdown of the marriage was at fault of the wife for her infidelity and that this should impact her award and spousal support. And that the judge will look at that and they do look at that. So um, is the judge in essence like punishing that person for fault? But I, 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 I hate to use the word punish, but it's 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 been long since case law that um, and, and factors of of the Michigan spousal support that this is an opportunity for um, litigators to utilize these arguments that where they otherwise can't in a no fault state to um, find equity in the final settlement of the divorce when it pertains to spousal support. So it's more so what's fair. Um, I don't know so much as it's a, a mechanism to punish. Okay. And again, spousal support, that is no law that says if this, then you get spousal support. If that, that you don't get spousal support. Uh, uh, family law uh, courts are courts of equity, meaning the judge is it. He is the judge. She is the judge. She is the jury. She's the trier of facts. And it all falls on that one person, the judge. 
and and um, the judge tries to do what the judge considers to be fair. That's why we call it a court of equity. Yes, all courts must be courts of equity in a general sense, mm-hmm. but there are really very there are really very vague or very general guidelines in family law as to how a judge ought to rule on this that or the other that is why the judge has a lot of leeway and in a in a in a family case in a divorce case it's who is your judge how is your judge likely to rule how does your judge view certain matters and so forth and so on the judge is all you need to know because there are no books that say this, that, and whatever. There is case law, uh, but it's far less codified. Family law is far less codified. There are far less Michigan compiled laws about family law than about the no-fault law or about auto law, you know? And, And even the ones that are codified, the, you know, the Custody Act and the Child Support yeah. Act, those things, sometimes even there are built in to the codified that as it's somewhere at the bottom, you'll see at at, at what is equity and what is equitable, what is uh, reasonable. And that still right. gives the judge a lot of a lot of movement, even in the codified law. So right. it, 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 well, there the are judge- laws that apply, but yes, you're right. Absolutely. It's a, it's a court of equity all the right. way. Right. And so the judge must decide what is fair, what is just, just what is equitable. And the, the, the judge does not get to share in that decision with seven jurors. He is the jury. She is the jury and she is or he is the judge. He is it. He's the one who's going to decide who's lying, who's exaggerating, who's playing victim, who's, who's the real victim here, who deserves what. Including, you know, if do you have to prove, by the way, when we talk about domestic abuse or cheating, do you have to prove, do you have to be convicted of domestic abuse? Um, well, technically speaking, they just have to make the allegation, Jamana. They, they, they make the allegation and it's but looked at, but it's the weight, yes, the weight is not going to be there if you don't have something to show for it. You can, Anyone can walk into court and say that they were a victim of abuse, but if, if there's not something that's going to support it, um, it's going to be a little bit more difficult on the judge, right? That is the jury and has to weigh out the facts and evidence and what is more um, believable or not. If, if, Again, One the per- judge has to decide yeah. if this person is throwing allegations or there are facts that point in the direction or support the accusation of domestic violence. Or Correct. Of, of, or infidelity or something along that. Police reports and surveillance and, and all of that. I, I understand. Because yeah, text messages even sometimes. If there's no police report, we'll, we'll utilize a text. If there was an admission that may have been made or, or a conversation between the parties um, about, you know, an incident that occurred, uh, an apology or something like that. If there's something that the judge can lean on and, and gives the, the accusation or the, um, the, uh, testimony of the person who's saying that they were abused, um, the, the judge is going to want to be careful of making sure that they're not just, um, basically, you know, off the cuff saying, oh, well, I believe her. They, they also want to protect the other person from somebody who's trying to get more or get something that would otherwise not be awarded to them just by making an allegation. So they're going to be cautious. It's, it's going to be a little bit more than just your word. You, you, you got to have something to say, this is what happened. And this is how I show you that it happened. Um, and, and the great weight of the evidence will apply um, whether or not they believe your testimony and whether or not they're going to make a decision about your spousal support based on what you've presented to them. They might find that it is lacking or woefully deficient um, in, um, you know, being proved to them that this happened or that it is impacted, um, you know, the the breakdown of the marriage so much that the uh, spousal support um, should be impacted uh, thereafter, uh, you know, after having listened to you. So it's all judges are used to parties throwing accusations and outrageous accusations at each other at the time. It's like divorce court is like very inflammatory. I mean, if you watch, whoa, Mm -hmm. accusations flying both ways. He did this, she said that. It's 
It's so sad. Yes, it's a lot of emotion, and people sometimes who are otherwise normally very composed um, in professional settings, you know, tend to lose their composure in the divorce court, um, especially if an accusation gets thrown around, then all of a sudden you see them going back and forth making accusations. And it's all the emotions, right, that are going into it. You know, you're losing the marriage or you're losing the home or, you know, there's other things that are at play. Um, Maybe somebody was, you know, uh, felt disrespected in the marriage or um, was otherwise, you know, uh, like cheating or something like this. This can raise tensions very high. And so, yes, you're right. Sometimes in divorce court, It can be our family court. It can be very um, uh, vicious and very uh, tumultuous and even in the courtroom. And luckily, the judges who are on um, the bench are, you know, trained to take care of that and, you know, usually will shut it down very quickly. But um, it it is difficult to maintain um, those emotions when you're going through it. It is very easy to say, well, I'm not going to throw a fit in the court and I'm not going to upset the judge and I'm going to, you know, be on my best behavior. But when you get in, in that situation, it, it can be difficult when you're going through something as emotionally heart-wrenching as a divorce. No question. We see it here in depositions in the office in the context of a car accident. When the defense lawyer starts asking a person injured in a car accident some personal questions, they're not terribly too personal. We see how our clients get very upset and we warn them in advance that they will be asking personal questions that seem to be of no relevance to your car accident and to your medical condition that you put here at issue by filing a lawsuit. But they have the right to ask because the rules of evidence are very, very loose. Uh, anything that is you know, related or likely to, to lead to the discovery of, of, uh, of uh, evidence, admissible evidence. And so we can see, and sometimes defense lawyers use it to get under people's skin and get them to lose control. So. Absolutely. I I can only imagine, and the nature of these questions isn't even remotely close to what happens in family court. And we see what happens to our clients. They get very upset. They lose it. They get angry. They become heated. They become, um, what's the word, Um, um, not just adversarial, but confrontational, confrontational with the defense lawyer. And the defense lawyers often, often knows what they're doing. They just want to see because one of the things they're trying to do here is trying to see if this case goes to trial, how well would this person do in front of a jury? What and would it, it, oh, it, it exactly? I was just going to say that. How are they going to do in front of a jury? Yep. Right. How easy is it to pro- uh, provoke this person? Um, and so it's I, the same in family court, Jamana. That it's the even though the judge is the jury, right? They they right. are testing you to see how are you going to do in an evidentiary hearing when you're supposed to be the primary caregiver, for example, of the children, but you're you're so easily uh, agitated if they're trying to to make a case for themselves that you are not, uh, you know, as fit as the other parent because of your anger issues or something like that. They will, uh, or your moral issues, and they will get very personal about what you do in your free time. And um, it, it, it's all public record, which I think goes to another point which you made, which is, you know, they, they become, you know, very upset that this is getting told in front of a judge or this is being, this accusation is flying around on a public record in a public forum with people sitting in and listening um, of the public. And uh, it, it, you, it's very, again, it, to put yourself in that situation, you might say, well, no, I'm not going to lose control. I understand what you're saying when you're preparing me, but when you're in it and it's happening to you, it's, it can be very difficult to really know how you're going to react when somebody says something very egregious or heinous sometimes in family court, very heinous accusations that get thrown around, um, and, uh, how you will react. And, and it's difficult to, you know, how you can't blame the client for, their emo- their raw emotion, but you have, like you said, you have to prepare them that you know this might this might happen, and this is what they're trying, this is what they're aiming for, you know. Uh, Maria, when we have four minutes remaining, um, very quickly, and then I want to ask you about those shorter marriages that may sometimes lead to one person paying the other spouse's support. And in three minutes, we have to do those two things. Uh, how do you control a client? You, you, you prepare them, you talk to them in advance, but now 
you know, they lose control. What, what do you do to get them back on track? In my practice, I find that being a family law attorney, you really using counselor as a, you're not a counselor in the traditional sense, but you have to truly know your client's case and your client as a person and what their triggers are and what's going to upset them. And when you see it coming, even though you've prepared them, you know, gentle hand on the shoulder, a finger real low down, you know, reminding them, keep your calm, keep your calm. Um, and, and letting them know that you might be giving them those signals to relax, to relax. I've got this, let me handle it. Um, that goes a long way. If you know your client, it's so important to know your client and know the case and what's going to be triggering and, um, in, inadequate preparation, but also being there for them as their advocate and making sure they trust that you've got this. That's how I handle it. Um, you know, our time will not permit us to go into those short-term marriages where one person gets uh, gets to ask and obtain alimony or spousal support. So maybe, God willing, next Tuesday we begin with that. This has been a very helpful, very wonderful information, as always, Maria. And telling the listeners, again, reminding them that this show, like all of our shows, will be on YouTube within the next day or so, and they can be found on the Jumana Kiru's YouTube channel. If you want to subscribe to that channel, then you will be notified every time there is a download. Uh, and, you know, you can choose by subject, whether it's bankruptcy you want to listen to, family law, immigration, personal injury. Attorney Maria Penchenko, we thank you very much for your time and expertise. Rami, thank you very much. Thank you to all of our listeners. Tomorrow, talking about car accidents. Thank you so much. مكاتب المحامية جمانة كيروس تتمنى لكم السلامة في ظل انتشار وباء كوفيد 19. المحامية جمانة كيروس مثلت على مدى 22 عاما ضحايا حوادث السيارات مع طاقم من المحامين ذوي الخبرة وحصلت لموكليها على تعويضات بمئات الملايين من الدولارات قبل أن تختار المحامي الذي سيدافع عن قضيته. دقق في تاريخه المهني ومع مكاتب جمانة كيروس تنذهل بآراء مئات الموكلين وخبراتهم الإيجابية في جوجل ريفيوز. مكاتب المحامية جمانة كيروز يتحدثون لغتك العربية والكلدانية 248-557-3645